Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Okay, we are in Acts chapter 9 this morning. My favorite chapter in the book of Acts. Yeah, we are. We're trying anyway. Of course, Acts chapter 9. Oh, I'm sorry. Forgot to give you the info. Friendshipgracebrethren.com documents. If you'd like to download this or look at it. Rather than print it this year, that's what we decided to do. Acts chapter 9 is uh, the conversion of the Apostle Paul, or the Apostle Saul, however you would like to uh, view that. The conversion of Saul is viewed by many biblical scholars as the most important event to occur in the church since the events of Pentecost. When you, when you look at, back at all the characters in the early church, Paul is perhaps the most pivotal character. He's the one that was out planting churches that transformed an entire empire. We, we know Peter did some as well, and we know Peter went to, uh, to Rome. He was ex actually uh, executed in Rome, just as Paul was, very close in the same time as Paul was. But he didn't plant the churches, at least not ones that we know of, like Paul did. So when you, when you look at events in early church history, um, the conversion of Paul is uh, the most important to occur after the beginning of the church. It's clear from Luke's treatment of the conversion of Paul that he thought it was important. He spends a lot of time on, uh, on the the transformation of the Apostle Paul. He records it three times in the book of Acts. Two times where he's telling the story, where Paul is telling the story, this is how I was saved, and one time uh, as Luke is telling the story of how Paul was saved. This chapter serves as the preparation for the spread of the gospel to the Gentile world. Remember what, what the, the instruction by Jesus was to make disciples in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the, of the world. And the disciples stayed in Jerusalem until they got pressure, until they were attacked, and then they spread. And we saw that in the last couple of weeks. We saw as they were, they were spreading uh, in Samaria. Um, and now Paul is... is is pushing further out and and the spread of the gospel is occurring even further and so this chapter serves as the as the beginning of the spread of the gospel to the Gentile world up to this point the gospel was going out primarily to Jews or those associated with Jews such as Samaritans or the uh, uh, the proselytes but all of that's about the change. Luke builds in the chapter the connection between the ministry to Israel and the ministry to Gentiles. Saul, or Paul, was introduced to us in chapter 7 um, at the martyrdom of Stephen. Following Stephen's execution, Paul stepped up his persecution of the church, which resulted in the ministry to the Samaritans. And Saul was the perfect person to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. He was from Tarsus, a Greek Roman city. He had the credentials of being a Pharisee and probably a member of the Sanhedrin. He knew the Jewish culture and language well, so he could explain the life of Jesus in the Old Testament properly to those who didn't have the historical knowledge or experience. He was a Roman citizen which provided him many benefits and uh, privileges 
He also had the benefit of knowing a secular trade so he could support himself in the ministry. So let's look at chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. But Paul, still breathing out or breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the, to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. The paragraph uh, begins with Saul still. The adverb still takes the reader back to Acts chapter 8 verse 3 where Saul was trying to destroy the church. He received from the high priest letters of authorization or what we would today call warrants. The high priest was issuing warrants for the arrest of people engaged in blasphemy. There is some debate among scholars about how how what these warrants contained were they wanted dead or alive like we used to have in the old west was paul given the authorization to execute we see that paul was there and i believe was the prosecutor for stephen when they executed him what was the penalty in israel for blasphemy death by stoning so it makes sense that Paul would be given warrants that provided for execution if the people didn't want to come willingly back to Jerusalem you know Damascus to Jerusalem that's a 150 mile walk you know it's gonna take a little bit of time it's gonna be a bad day to, to make that journey um, And it seems logical, since we saw what happened with Stephen, that these warrants were not just to bring back, but to also execute if that's what was necessary. The Roman government had given the high priest and the Sanhedrin pretty good autonomy concerning uh, the governing of religious practices of the Jews, not just confined to Israel. The the Roman government had given the Sanhedrin and the high priest control of Jews everywhere in the empire. So Jews in Rome, Jews in Damascus, Jews in uh, Corinth, wherever they were, operated under the auspices of what was going on in Jerusalem. That's why this, the, the high priest was appointed by Rome. So they could control what the high priest was going to do. So even though Damascus was outside of, of Israel proper, it, uh, it fell under the guidelines. These were Jews, and so the Sanhedrin and the high priest had, uh, had authority over them. Since Saul began his persecution, Christians were spreading out, as evidenced by the preceding chapters in Acts. Saul was on his way to, Dam to, to Damascus, in Syria to seek out Jews who had become Christians. The timing of this is about two years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So we're, we're looking somewhere at, at in that time frame. So the church hadn't, hadn't grown yet a, a ton. You know, we have those, those, big, those big events where 3,000 or 5,000 are added to the church and so forth. But it hasn't spread out a lot. But it's beginning to look like Damascus was a growing Christian center as Paul, Saul, is, is terrorizing churches in and around Israel. They're starting to spread out. And uh, Damascus is an early church uh, center. Saul knew that he could find many Christians there. So let me ask you a question. On what theological or biblical basis was Saul persecuting the church and Christians? You know, we always give Israel a hard time, but was this a legitimate thing? Yeah, I think it was. It was legitimate from what they understood God to have said. Their understanding was faulty, but 
God hadn't presented to them the Trinity. God hadn't presented to them the, the, the triune nature of, of God. And they said uh, the Shema twice a day, remember. Hear, O Israel, our God, he is one. And Jesus standing there, you know, they, they understood God was not a man that could be reckoned with. So Jesus standing there and equating himself to God, and then people following him were committing blasphemy. So from their point of view, it was legitimate to go after Paul because from their system, he was blasphemy. And so according to, to the Pharisees, what the church was teaching was heresy and was worthy of punishment. And we, we know that Saul later on said, look, I wanted to be the best Pharisee I could be. I wanted to be a Pharisee's Pharisee. I wanted to be very strict about keeping of the law. And that meant I had to go after those who that I saw weren't. I've got the hiccups again. Verse 3, now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul heard a voice. And as we'll see later the text in the text that he saw him as well. What he saw is in debate among scholars. It may be Jesus as the Shekinah glory of God, the light from heaven. Or Saul may have seen in the middle of the light the risen Jesus. In whatever way Saul, Saul saw him, it was fundamental to Saul being called an apostle that he had seen the risen Jesus. When I, when I try to conceptualize of this in my brain, as finite as that is, I, I see the Shekinah glory of God that had been missing from Israel and Paul would have recognized that and standing in the middle of the Shekinah glory in the middle of the bright light who he would recognize to be Jesus if Paul in fact was a member of the Sanhedrin he would have been in Israel two years earlier when Jesus was there I think Paul may have even been on the Sanhedrin at the time Jesus was tried. So he would know what he physically looks like. So when Paul's on the road to Damascus and this bright light comes there, and then standing in the middle of the, of the light, he sees Jesus, he would recognize him. Now, think about that. Here is Paul going out after Christians for blaspheming because Jesus isn't God, to be confronted with the guy he saw die on the cross standing before him. So the brain is kicking around going, no wait, the, the disciples stole his body. How is this even possible? You can imagine how that's all going on. I, I, I think that comes later. I think as he's blind... And he's sitting for three days without food and water in, in Damascus, waiting on Ananias. I think, I think that's when the process of, wow, did I really mess up here? Or, boy, was I delusional. Or something. He, you know, three days, no bread and water. He's, he's going to be wondering what's really going on. So far. Yeah, we'll get to that. Yep. Why was it important for those leaders called apostles to have seen the risen Jesus? Remember when, when Judas had hung, had hung himself and they were replacing him with Matthias, 
one of the requirements was that they saw Jesus and that they had seen the risen Jesus. Why was that important? To be an apostle. Exactly. So they could stand up and testify, I have seen the risen Jesus. We're not talking about a uh, hypothetical situation. You know, if, if we're talking about, yeah, I've seen him. I know he's alive. They're the foundation of the church. And it's important that they had the ability to, to articulate that. Resurrection is the core of Christian doctrine. Jesus dying provided for us a payment of the penalty of sin, but if Jesus had remained dead, it would not have been sufficient. It takes the resurrection to make it sufficient, and you've got to be able to articulate that. And Saul, Saul was on the ground in the bright light around him. He hears Jesus ask, why are you persecuting me? question reveals something about Jesus and the church. First it reveals the tight union between Jesus and the church. Jesus didn't ask, why are you persecuting the church? Which is what Paul was doing. He was going out after the church. Paul didn't believe Jesus was even there. And Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? Jesus didn't ask why you're persecuting the church. He personalized it. In many ways, this exposure to Jesus in this way was the beginning of Saul's understanding of Christians being in Christ. The question also reveals that there is no separation of the church from Jesus Christ. The real true church is headed by Jesus and is so tightly associated with him there can be no separation. And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. That TV ward back there or something. Holy cow. I'm not coughing. Uh -huh. I'm not coughing this minute. Yes. No. He's using the word uh, cure, and for, which is Lord. And it is the same. As, it, it has all of, the, all of the, the, the distance that you can have. It goes from being sir or mister to sovereign Lord. There is no adjective with it. To, uh, to tell us, and I'm of the belief that he is recognizing someone of greater superiority than him, but I don't think yet Paul's at the point where he recognizes that we are talking about the sovereign God. So I think I'm going to take the middle road. It's somewhere in the middle between Mr. and Sovereign Lord. It's, he's recognizing the superiority. If somebody's standing over you and knocks you to the ground and it's covered in bright white light, you're going to recognize their superiority. And I think that's as far as, his, as that statement goes at this, at this point. Saul didn't immediately recognize Jesus, but he did recognize that he was in the presence of someone more powerful. Um... Jesus introduces himself to Saul by saying, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And the second time Jesus identifies him, it's the second time Jesus identifies himself with the church. Now here's the verse in the King James. This is in the ESV. Here's the verse in the King James. And he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. The problem is that last statement, it is hard for you to kick against the goads, is not in the best manuscripts that we have, the earliest and cleanest manuscripts. New King James picks it up. King James has it, and some other translations have it. When Paul tells this story later on in, in the book of Acts, it is there, and it is in the earliest manuscripts. So it is something that is 
that Jesus said, but Acts or uh, Luke didn't record it the first time in Acts. When the Tory story is retold later in Acts, it is there. But in the earliest manuscripts, in this verse, it's not there. So, there's a reason. I don't know what the reason is, but there's a reason that it's that way. Some scribe said, oh, when he told the story before, this is what Jesus said. So, let's put that in here. That's what we believe happened. Because Luke records it, Paul saying it, quoting Jesus. You know, because later on in the book of Acts in, uh, uh, I forget where it is. Acts 26, 14, where Paul is speaking of his conversion experience, he, he says that Jesus said these things. But when Dr. Luke is telling the story in chapter 9, he doesn't use those words. So, not, not significantly important, but you need to know that the original text has been altered a little. Um... A goad is, uh, um, you have seen people ride racehorses, and they have a, a whip-like. A goad is kind of like that, something that is used to, to push along. And, and so the imagery here is, you're, you're kicking against the prodding you're being pushed on. Yeah, there's still a great big question mark on her face. Wow. Exactly. Saul. Saul, yes. Yeah, Jesus is saying to him, why are you, uh, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. It's hard for you to, to push back on the pressure that, that the Holy Spirit is putting on you. And you're, you're just resisting, resisting, resisting. Absolutely, it's a losing battle. You, you can't beat the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, but rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The resurrected Jesus commanded Saul to get up and go into the city, where he'll be told what to do. In the King James and the New King James, uh, the word, so he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? They were added to the original text at the time. Um, the, the text from Acts 26, as seen, uh, as seen above, in this verse, we see the, the first of many commands that Saul, Paul, would obey in his ministry. Saul was persecuting the church because of perceived blasphemy of Jesus, and now he was confronted with the reality that Jesus was alive, and God was to be, <coughs> see now you got me coughing, obeyed. What do you want me to do? I submit to your authority. What do you want me to do? The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. We don't know what became of those men that were with him. Um, they experienced the light and the transformation of Saul, but they didn't see Jesus. Luke records they were speechless, meaning they were overwhelmed by the event. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. This event blinded Saul. We'll see later on that scales were on his eyes, and he couldn't see anything. Many theorize that this later led to his thorn in the flesh that he would record there is nothing in the text to support that conclusion. Saul had to rely on his traveling companions to complete the journey to Damascus. There's all sorts of theories that Saul was blinded and received his sight again, but his eyes were permanently damaged. Later on in one of the, in one of the uh, letters he writes, see what big hand I write, or what big letters I write, like because he's, he's nearly blind he has to do that. I'm not convinced by any of that. I don't think his thorn in the flesh was his eyesight. I think the thorn in the flesh was people and was, uh, was the attacks on him. But a lot of uh, scholars believe that, that this led to his 
thorn in the flesh, being nearly blind. Verse 9, And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. So there he is, he's led into Damascus, he's sitting in a hotel or wherever, um, and he is blind. He's not eating or drinking. You can imagine now that this Pharisee, who completely understood the Old Testament, or completely knew the Old Testament, some even argue that had to memorize the Old Testament. And here he is, blind, can't see or do anything, and so he is now contemplating his role in the world. What is going on? I've come face to face with a guy that's dead, and he wasn't on a ghost tour in Savannah. You can go on ghost tours now if you haven't been to Savannah. You, you can do the same in New Orleans. We have ghosts here? Okay, good. We've got stupid ghosts in Fort Myers, I can guarantee you that. From ZombieCon. So there he is, sitting in this room all alone, with no real sense of what's going on, contemplating, going through... I can imagine Paul reciting to himself Isaiah 53 and saying, well, okay, that makes sense now. You know, coming to the realization that what he had understood was in error and now that he has come face to face with the risen Jesus, he's beginning to put two and two together. Imagine what he was thinking, the confusion that he must have been dealing with. Everything he thought he knew and understood was turned upside down. He had begun his journey to persecute the church and ended up meeting the risen Jesus. Jesus was supposed to be dead. His body was supposed to be stolen by the disciples. Now there he was. He was God. He was not blaspheming. That's a big deal. For a good Jewish boy like him, that's a big deal to get to that point. So my question is, have you ever experienced such a reversal in your life? Have you ever been to, the, to a point where you, you were certain this was true, only to find out that it wasn't? <coughs> Go on in Acts now there was a, a disciple at Damascus named Ananias the Lord said to him in a vision Ananias and he said here I am Lord and the Lord said to him rise and go to the street called straight and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul for behold he is praying and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. And Ananias said, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. So, picture Ananias here. He's obviously in the know about what's going on in the early church and he has a vision um, vision um, the word used here for vision is the Greek word horomatai which is often translated directly as sight not just vision but saw um, it's also translated um, uh, have seen and I saw the risen Jesus just as Saul had Jesus told Ananias to go to a specific house so you imagine Ananias he is confronted by Jesus standing there uh, uh, what are you doing here? And he would recognize him. And Jesus says to him, 
go down to the to the main street straight and go to this particular house and there you'll find Saul he's waiting for you I can just imagine what his thoughts are God maybe you don't know this but he's trying to kill me I'm not going to this guy he's trying to kill me you we we would do that right I would respond that way for sure no I'm not doing that because I know better than you I know he's trying to kill me everybody knows he's trying to kill me you can you can imagine how that went on right for the first time in the book of Acts members of the church were called saints um, verse uh, he has done to your saints at Jerusalem so Ananias goes through this little dance with the Lord and agrees to go and agrees to to do uh, what he's told to do and he reminds the Lord that there are saints there I, I think this is I, I don't know if Dr. Lucan planned it to be like this but I, to me it's interesting that this is the first time that the word saints is used in reference to the church what what does that mean what does the word saint mean it is the Greek word hagios which has the root meaning of sacred or holy it is used to talk about things that are culled out or separated or set apart the idea is that 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 Ananias is is saying here that Christians are called out of the world we're different than the world set apart holy dedicated to God when we when we look back at at the use of of that term it is the the lamb that was separated from the herd to be protected and and used for uh, sacrifice it was those things that were separated or dedicated directly for use by God etc and so Ananias saying to God how much evil has come upon your saints your called out ones this is a whole new dynamic that we haven't seen yet in reference to uh, to the church Well, yeah, they, the the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church and and uh, I think even the Lutheran Church don't view all Christians as saints. In the Catholic Church, you have to perform a couple of miracles and and a couple of things have to happen before you can be venerated as a saint. But that's all determined by the Pope. And one of our most recent previous popes has been now elevated to sainthood. But we're all saints. We're all, if you use the word the way it's in, intended, we're all set apart by God, called out to serve him directly. That's, that's what saint means. And, and uh, it's unfortunate that so much of our theology gets dictated to, by people that don't have good theology. We've already answered that question. But the Lord said to him, this is the Lord speaking to Ananias after he objected, hey, he's trying to kill me. The Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. This is fascinating to me. Paul is on his way to Damascus to kill Christians. He comes face to face with the risen Jesus and now is now the Lord tells Ananias that he's my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children children of Israel so he is going to be he's going to be planting churches and seeing Christ, people made Christians that are Gentiles that are royal and that are Jews that's what the Apostle Paul's legacy will be now 
Think about this statement from the vantage point of poor Ananias, who still is convinced, despite hearing from Jesus, he's still convinced this guy's trying to kill him. And Jesus says, don't worry about it, he's my chosen guy. He obeys, he obeys immediately, but there has to be a question mark in the back of his head. He's walking down the street and he turns the corner onto Straight Street and he goes to Judas's house and he goes, I don't want to knock on the door. I don't want this to be true. I can understand that. God had said that he was going to be his chosen vessel, or that he was his chosen vessel. When did God make that choice? Thank you. Very good. 2018 is a success. Yes. We'll see the ministry of, of Paul unfold before us in the rest of the book of Acts. As, in fact, the ministry to the Gentiles and the Jews and several royal figures. One of Paul's desire to get to Rome was to have an impact on the house of Rome. The, the royal house. And we see that he does that. Up, on, up to almost the level of the emperor. Perhaps even up to that level. So, Jesus was predicting to Ananias what the life of Paul would be like. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Jesus was giving Ananias a prophecy concerning how much Saul would have to suffer for the sake of the name of Jesus. He was there to arrest Christians and now the prediction that he was going to suffer for the gospel. Think about the emotional response Ananias must have had at these words from Jesus. Saul, the persecutor of the church, will suffer for the name of Christ, from being the persecutor to being the persecuted. So Ananias departed and entered the house and Laying hand, his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm impressed with Ananias. I look forward to meeting him and say, well done for being so obedient. Despite all the worldly circumstances. If there were church growth seminars, they would have said, don't do it. If there were people that you could call and get encouragement or direction and help in whether or not you should do something, they would say, don't do it. Everything said, don't do it, except Jesus, and he did it. And look at the... We can lay at the feet of Ananias all the success of Paul because he was the one that that I believe went there and talked to him what's recorded is is a small portion of it I don't think Paul became saved on the road to Damascus I don't think he was saved though during those three days I think he was saved right there with Ananias trying to figure out what it meant Paul had to get some help to get things organized in his brain. And I think Ananias is the one that's responsible for that, along with, obviously, the Holy Spirit. And he, uh, he then, Ananias recognizes, laying his hands on him, saying, Brother Saul, to me that means they've had a conversation Ananias now understands who Saul is and understands that Saul knows who Jesus is and has, has, has made that commitment, has made that transformation. His life has begun to transform. And so he recognized him as a fellow believer 
and uh, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ananias demonstrated obedience even in the face of fear and apprehension. He laid hands on him and his mission was to bring Saul the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and restore his sight. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. Saul had been blind for three days since the event on the road to Damascus. When Ananias laid hands on him, scales fell off his eyes, permitting Saul to see again. Luke, as a physician, detailed Saul's blindness. The detail he recorded it in demonstrates to us the supernatural cause of the blindness and the restoration of sight. When I read the, the description by Dr. Luke, and he regained his sight, I don't read that he regained some of his sight. I don't read that his eyes were damaged. I read that he regained his sight. Just like on, on the first part of the trip to Damascus that he could see, he now can see again. I don't think that we can conclude from the text that it was his eyes that are his thorn in the flesh. As was custom and practice two years into the early church, um, baptism immediately followed salvation. We don't know where the baptism occurred, just that it did. It was important for the early church to demonstrate in a public manner their allegiance to a new master, the triune God. So Ananias somewhere finds a place to baptize him. I fantasize about it being in a mikvah. Because that would have sent the Jews into a complete dither, which we know they were afterwards. And it would have been a perfect fulfillment of Paul's Pharisaical ideas. The Pharisees were very diligent about ceremonially cleaning, ceremonial cleanliness, and getting prepared for worship. And so outside the synagogue in, uh, in Damascus was probably a good-sized mikvah, since there was a large Jewish population there. And since they were both Jews, I'd like to think that they went to the mikvah and went down into the water and, and Ananias baptized them there. I got no clue if that's what happened. That's just the way I like to, to see it in my mind. Because of what that demonstrates about the transformation of the Apostle Paul. Oh, yeah, yeah. The other Pharisees would have just had a conniption. This would have been a bad thing, a bad day. Because remember, the mikvah was something you did by yourself. The process was you, you stood at the top of the stairs. There were stairs with a handrail in the middle. And the water had to be moving water, if possible. So it fed by a spring, usually. And you'd take your clothes off. And you'd go down into the water and come back around the other side, come up and put fresh clothes on. And that then signified you were clean to go into the temple or into, the, uh, into worship. The way I envision this happening is Paul goes down one side, Ananias goes down the other side, and he dunks them three times right there in the mikvah, which would have been completely contrary to how the Jews would have done it. Yeah. They always had to have a, a priest. A priest, yeah. Not, not just a rabbi, but a priest. And I have to assume that the priest had lots of duties, but was there at the mikvah when you came by to, to be ceremonially cleansed, to, because it had to be verified, had to be certified. So that, that's just the way my, my mind works, that I, I, I want it to be as big a contrast as possible, and that would have made it so. In verse 19, in taking food, he was strengthened, 19a. Saul had to be weak 
I know when I don't eat for three minutes, I get weak, and he hadn't eaten for three days. He went three days without food or water. The shock of his experience on the road to Damascus also contributed to his physical condition. Once he eats, his strength returns. What impressed you the most concerning Paul's conversion experience? What's the most impressive to you part of, of this conversion experience? Paul's? Yeah. I think Ananias' obedience is, is, is way bigger. But Paul certainly, you know, he's standing in or on the ground. You know, it's always pictured that he falls to his face on the ground. And, uh, and there is the, the, the Shekinah glory and Jesus standing in the middle of it. And, and he does what he's told. The shock of it to me. You know, you're on your way to kill Christians, or at least arrest Christians, and you end up becoming one. Ananias, to me, is the hero of the story. No, God, they're trying to kill me. Go take care of him. Lay your hands on him. As, give him the Holy Spirit. He's my chosen guy. Okay, God, I'll, I'm not sure about that. I'll do it. That's the way I see this happening. Okay, let's get to the end of uh, verse... Uh, nope, we're not going to do that. We're going to stop at, eight, at 19a. I'm going to write that down so I don't forget. Yeah. The only thing I would say different about what you said, not once he chooses you, because he chose you before, once, once you know that. See, you go throughout your life and you may not know that he chose you. Right. Once, once you get there to the intersection of the spiritual and the, and the physical world, when that happens, and holy cow, things are really different than I thought they were. And, and that's where Paul was, you know. Here he was going to kill Christians, and he ends up, I think three days later becoming one. Um, a lot of people think that he was, or believe that he was saved there on the road to Damascus. I don't think he had yet made that, put that everything together. I think it took some time. Yeah. Because he knew what he knew. And he knew he was right. 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 That's right. I'm glad you put it that way because that's exactly true. People don't understand that. They think he just wanted to kill Christians. No, he was doing what the God, what he understood God to say. In the same, oh, I'm going to get in all sorts of trouble for this. In the same way that really good Muslims do today. Yeah. Well, good Muslim. Well, it's a bad guy, but it's a good Muslim. So in that same way. Right. Right, because they didn't want to lose their gravy train. Right. Thank you, Father, for this picture in, in your word for the salvation of, of Paul. How interesting it is, the characters that you put in in his way to uh, to reveal yourself to him. Thank you for Ananias and for the work that he did, the unsung hero of uh, of the the Christian age. Thank you for that. Thank you for for these folks and for the discussion that we could have for the for the uh, the deep look we can have into your word. We trust that you are honored and glorified by that. And as we uh, as we gather again together for for worship that that would bring you glory and all the attention would be on you we love you in jesus name thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from friendship grace brethren church please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you 
Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.